Welcome to Pier Glass Poetry Panels. Today's focus is the poetry of coping. I'm your host, Stan Galloway, and today's show just might change your life. Thank you for joining in. The first of today's poets is Jill Alexander Esbaum. She is the award-winning author of several collections of poetry, including Heaven, Harlot, Necropolis, and the single poem chapbook, The Devastation. Her first novel, Hausfrau, debuted on the New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 26 languages. Her work has appeared in dozens of journals, including Poetry, The Christian Century, Image, and The Rumpus, as well as multiple Best American Poetry anthologies. A two-time ADA fellow, Jill is a core faculty member in the Low Residency MFA program at University of California, Palm Desert. She lives in Austin, Texas. We're so glad you could join us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm actually in Palm Springs right now. So, you know, it's a really hard life when you can write poetry in Palm Springs, I'm just saying. And look at the beautiful mountains and palm trees are neat. I, it, I encourage everybody to visit a place where there, are, there is sunshine and palm trees. Um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I have three poems that I'm going to read, and they're not terribly long. They all uh, appear in this book that I had come out last year called Woodland from Cooper Dillon Press. If you don't know that press, it's fantastic. I don't think there's a single author on there that I wouldn't drink with <laughs> and have to dinner. Uh, well, I'll, I'll read and then we can talk about coping. This one's called Stays. Everything alludes to the mood of us. This color, for instance, the color of you. Blood blue like the walls of the house we share. Blue black like the ravels in my hair. Everything habituates the shatter of our glass. This tiger of yours that mauls on command, or yours, the upper hand of dispute, the furnace you promised to fix but good, it didn't, but haven't, or won't, ain't gonna. A tainted summer of untoward words, the unnerved synapse twixt said and heard, the lapse in my verve, the slap of your verbs. How every well we've doused runs dry. The drowsy oh wells, the soused betrothals, the stab wounds we dressed up in bedclothes. Everything augments the flaw of us, the lusters we lack, the lusts we've gutted, the delusions we've slutted on analyst couches, your Stalinist urges, my purges. I reach for the one-two punch of panic pills. You sit and sort the bills. A pair of parallel hells. The gods that goad us know our names. The books you read disclaim my pain. And everything stays the same, the same. So that's a little happy little poem right there. Uh, these, these poems, two of them I wrote when I lived in Switzerland. And... Switzerland is very beautiful, not unlike Palm Springs without the palm trees and the swimsuit weather. But it was a terrible time for me. The good news is I got a book and a novel out of it. So uh, remember that our terrible times are sometimes our most fertile times. I remember the day I finished this poem. It was one of the last lunches my husband and I shared at our favorite pizza place in the town we lived in and we were not getting along and it was completely over and I was slowly packing my stuff to move back to Texas and I still read this poem to him. He was always very supportive of my poetry even if we didn't particularly like each other and his comment was huh I get it. So it was useful for me to be able to speak in that language to him and I was very lucky because when a relationship is ending, it's not always how it goes. And you can't always read your, I kind of hate you a little bit, poems to your uh, about to be ex. 
that was that was a moment of coping for me over pizza in the sunshine in Switzerland and sadness over sadness. This one I tried to write in Switzerland, but I couldn't. I think it needed the space and the, the gestation of a few years afterwards. Uh, it's a prose poem, but I'll jump right in. She spent a year hallucinating birds. They perched on roofs and fences and sills. They posed statues still on ordinary lines. They aligned along cables like prayer beads on rope. They amassed all mass on the cemetery lawn and marauded the broad yawning fields like cattle. Their cackles were black. Each shadow dove and pecked. They nested in chimneys and chirped at the chime of the church bell. They worked in shifts, clocked out at odd hours. They laid their eggs in the V's of trees. They teamed on the dry baked banks of creeks, streams the sun had overseen. They teetered on the bed knob tops of flagpoles. They pitched like pits into founts or babies into wells. They paced her train and lunged the platform when she disembarked. They thumped her doors, then skulked away like hoodlum teens. They jabbed her. When she cried, they did it faster. Everyone knows what happened next. They grew in size. They multiplied in some, some as big as sunflower stalks, others tall like bonfire flames or moving vans, or the sick brick houses people die inside of every night. Their hatchlings canopy the sky. Was it her fault then when they pinned her to the ground and thrust their feathers down her throat or wormed between her legs in bad man ways or rattled plumes and whooped and beat her body with their wings or locked their talons to her thighs and tra la that ditty from the old time music box? They forced their whiskeys past her lips and put her in the pillory. This was foreplay in a way. They rolled in rabid packs and woofed like dogs. She couldn't throw a bone. The meat was gone. They chased her and they named her and they boiled her tears and bathed her. Then they ate her. So that one needed a little more, like I said, gestation time because anger takes a while to be born out of fear and sadness. Uh, it's and I mean, everybody's different, but there's a tendency with me when I'm so deep in despair, and, and it was despair at the time, I couldn't sleep. I wandered the fields and the paths at night, and if you're not sleeping, those little you always feel like you're missing something right here. You see something and you turn around and of course nothing's there. And those were the, those were the birds for me. And it may not be clear what my favorite short story of all time is. It might be about some birds. Um, uh, the, and there's something about a bird in so many legends. It brings peace. It brings uh, nesting. It's, it's, it, it, it it can be a feminine sign, it's soaring. But there's other legends where, and also real life birds that do kind of peck you and eat you when you're dead. So uh, this was the middle ground. A lot of the poems, in fact, in this book kind of live in that middle space between I got this and fuck me, I hate my life, you know? And maybe that's where all the best poetry lives because you know, it's expressing the stuff you can't express in normal words. Partly because people won't understand it and partly because it's devastating to speak loud. This is the last one. And I did write this one in Switzerland. And I bet you can't guess what time I finished it. It's called 4.13 a.m. The shift of sleepwalks and suicides. The occasion of owls in a dim eye loon fog. Even God has nodded off and won't be taking prayers till 10. At interim, you put them on, as if your wants could keep you warm, as if. 
You say your shibboleths, you thumb your beads, you scry the glass. Night creeps to its precipice and the broken rim of reason breaks again. An obsidian sky betrays you. Every serrate shadow flays you. Soon enough, the crow will call, the cock will crow, the door will close. He isn't coming back, you know. And so we wet hours of grief relent. In 30 years, you might forget precisely how tonight's pain felt and in whose black house you dwelt. So I was having a real happy time at that moment. But when it, it's okay because a feeling can't hurt you, not in the way an experience can. And to translate a feeling into a moment on the page is to make art. And when I write poetry, that's the most important thing to me is to make art with words. I'm not there to tell people how I feel or how they should feel. It's to express this moment in such a way that you too can experience it. Not that I want you to go around feeling super sad, but you have felt super sad before, or you have felt uh, on the precipice of despair. And if I can approximate that feeling, then the closer I get to it, the closer I am to finishing it and then stacking it on the shelf where I'll know it, where I can keep my eye on it and I can revisit it anytime I need to. And I think everybody can too with others' poetry and with, with their own. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill, uh, for, for sharing your poetry, but mostly for being vulnerable with us, uh, with what you were going through and giving us some insight into uh, the, the inexpressible that becomes expressible uh, when we're coping with emotions. You know, and you have to, you have to at least try it. Otherwise it comes out subconsciously. Uh, you, you get sick, right? Or you can't, I mean, obviously you can't sleep. You get sick. You become uh, passive aggressive. You become aggressive. You got to put it somewhere. But thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Our next poet, Jay Rafferty, self-identifies as an uncle, an Irishman, and an Egypt. He's the social media manager for Sage Cigarettes magazine and a Best of the Net nominee. His debut chapbook, Holy Things, is forthcoming in early 2022, and you can read his other work in several journals, including Light on the Horizon and Daily Drunk Magazine. When not playing games of pool, he sometimes writes stuff. Seriously, welcome to Jay Rafferty. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, it's weird whenever you do these things to feel out of your depth. I am completely out of my depth here. <laughs> um, the first poem I wanted to read and talk about is called A World Entire. And um, it was written during my first year of university when I hadn't been diagnosed with depression yet. I hadn't gone for to seek treatment. I was just sort of continuing my kind of holding it in and keeping it to myself and dealing with it poorly. Um, but eventually, you know, I got help. I spoke with my parents about it and they understood, even though they were really saddened that I'd kept all this sadness and self-harm and self-hatred to myself all these years. I never asked for help because I didn't think that was an option. You know, I was free of hurting them. But this poem um, was sort of a way to cope with or to address all those years that I spent suffering by myself rather than actually A world entire. There's a little boy in a tiny room in the dark. I sit beside him, a rosary and a knife lie between us, reeking us desperation and self-hate. He raises a bottle to his lips. His left hand trembles. Mine, rarely now. He speaks to the darkness, 
I fill in the silence, my replies unheard. Father, forgive me. This isn't McDonald's, he doesn't take orders. What's the point? You to make it? Father, it's not fucking fair. Omniscient does not mean merciful. I'm tired. I'm so, so tired. Nightmares are easier in someone else's arms, you'll see. I'm a bad person. Nobody's good at it, they just pretend. I could stop it all. Why don't I just stop it all? Because... Poor digital character, and a worse executioner. Why won't you save me? I have. I am. I always will. There's a little boy in a tiny room in the dark. He wipes his shame from the knife. He wraps his rosary tight around his fist. The wood stains red. The bottles all empty. His tears and puddles on the pillow. I look at this boy, losing himself to an absent god and present sins. But I know, as he will learn, losing does not mean lost. So yeah, that poem, um, really, it, it sort of captures a thing that I try to use whenever I deal with sad topics or which I've begun to realize I write about too much is uh, a lot of angry topics, you know, a lot of only really represented or sort of accepted through little bits of humor, little bits of dark humor throughout them, um, which kind of leads into this next one. Uh, this poem is, I would say, the meat and the meat and the sandwich of uh, holy things, which comes out in um, 2022. Uh, it's holy things is a lot of poems about dealing with um, religion as and faith as part of your culture, as part of your identity. Um, and it's not just religion in that aspect. There's, you know, faith in philosophy, um, faith in politics, and faith in self, faith in love, that sort of thing. Uh, but when writing this, I was mostly focusing on how to deal with um, the fallout of a Catholic upbringing when you aren't necessarily religious anymore. Um, the writer Colin Tobin wrote a book called um, The Sign of the Cross, Travels in Catholic Europe, where he writes about Catholicism in small European countries as kind of part of their culture, even if they don't respect the clergy, even if they don't follow the Ten Commandments, some elements of Catholicism have worked their way into their culture. And um, I suppose this letter or this poem was a uh, response in the same way to my Catholic upbringing and a kind of, how do I cope with Ele uh, this thing which is an element of my culture that really hurts people and has hurt people throughout the years and has been misogynistic, has been racist, has been really terrible. So uh, this is, that's what the poem's about, is trying to cope with it in a kind of, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry sort of way. An open letter to the Pope. The Holy Father, Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, Primate of Italy, Sovereign of the Vatican City State, and Servant of the Servants of God. Well, big Pontiff, how's your cotton? Tell us this now, is it true the Almighty is the spitting image of Alanis Morissette? Is St. Peter still hanging upside down in your basement? I bet that left him with an awful red face when he saw her. Well, in his position, he could not have one, could he? Big P, does Metatron whisper in your dreams? Are they softly spoken? Do they always answer your calls? 
but they argued the foreman at the Tower of Babel, though they speak Klingon. These are serious theological concerns, I assure you. Big P has seen Christopher with the migrants in the trucks passing borders, on the rafts that don't make it. Does he carry bloated corpses to foreign shores? Was he in the train cars to Auschwitz and Dachau? Did he drag Jews from Shar to Furnace Doors? Was he on the slave ships too? Was he in coach or steerage? These are serious theological concerns, I assure you. He does Lucifer sound different than Metatron? Is he a good ventriloquist? Do he scream at you when you pray? Or is he as softly spoken as his sibling? Does he break wind in your vestry? Did he graffiti the Sistine Chapel? Did he draw rocket ships on the Almighty? He doesn't much look like her anyway. How do you tell the difference between the pair of them? Which the one that protected rapists got to be a cardinal in my diocese? Does the Vatican remember how many children it buried in secret? Is hush money tax deductible? These are serious theological concerns, I assure you. Big P, if Teresa had been born in Ireland, would she have run her laundry? Does Mary Magdalene hate them using her name? My grandmother was a child. The Sisters of Mercy beat her knuckles black and blue for holding a pen in her left hand. The bones stained like pen nibs. She taught me how to set a table, and I still put the knives on the left are her old teachers waiting to batter me too? What about the nuns who drowned fatherless babies? Are those women of the cloth all enjoying everlasting life? Would they have been sanctified for taking my granny's fatherless life too? And what is the cloth anyway? Did it cover Christ's good looks in the tomb? Was it Veronica's tea towel? Do you use it as a bib at supper? These are serious theological concerns, I assure you. Big P, I was a Catholic when I was a kid and didn't get a say. I guess I still am. I'm still scared when I enter a church. I still try to look holy at gravesides. I don't know the words to the Our Father, but I've gotten the rhythm now. I think I'd have made a good priest, but I'm no good with numbers. And the Almighty hasn't called mine yet. I'm still on the waiting list as it stands. I guess I'll wait still. I never liked middlemen. I figure you can understand that, the position you're in. Forgive my writing. I'm sure you're busy with one scandal or another, with prophylactics or pedophiles, but these are serious theological concerns, I assure you. And you're the closest thing to an answer I've got. Like, I know people who have come up through worse, worse, worse circumstances and have religious trauma attached, but I wouldn't say that's really affected me, only for the big Catholic guilt thing, which you can see in both those balls, I think. But that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Uh, we appreciate uh, you reminding us that we cope on so many different levels and that that coping begins at a very young age. Uh, uh, we're happy to have uh, thought with you uh, through some of those processes. Our third poet today, Cynthia Atkins, is the author of Psyche's Weathers, In the Event of Full Disclosure, and Still Life with God, and a collaborative chapbook forthcoming from Harbor Editions in 2022. Her work has appeared in numerous journals, including Alaska Quarterly Review, the American Journal of Poetry, Indianapolis Review, Thrush, Tinderbox, and Verse Daily. Formerly, Atkins worked as the Assistant Director for the Poetry Society of America and has taught English and creative writing 
most recently at Blue Ridge Community College. She is an interviews editor for American Microviews and Interviews. She earned her MFA from Columbia University and has earned fellowships and prizes from Breadloaf Writers Conference, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, The Writer's Voice, and Writers at Work. Atkins lives on the Maury River of Brookbridge County, Virginia, with artist Philip Welch and their family. We're happy to have you rounding out today's panel. Hi. Hi, Stan. Thanks for um, this wonderful uh, gathering of our tribe here and talking about craft and what it is that we write about. Um, I think we write about through our obsessions. When you asked and talked about this topic today, I thought about semantics, the word coping. What does that mean to cope? Um, in our culture that expects us all to be perfect at all times, happy, we have happy talk, we go on social media, and we, we prove to the world that somehow or other we're coping. Um, and there's probably more, not a more challenging time in any of our lives. And maybe one of the best things about COVID is that I think it allowed people to say, I'm having trouble coping where before I felt like, you know, it was very guarded and hidden what, what our coping mechanisms are. And I think it, it allowed people permission to say, hey, we're all on this, on this boat, you know, or, or we're all on the same, we're all on the same storm. I don't know if we're all on the same boat, but um, we all have different ways of coping. I have written about this topic a lot for my whole life, um, which is, the topic of mental health um, because I've had so much history in my family of mental health issues. I guess my whole life was about coping with these and how to deal with that kind of vacuum in a family um, that kind of sucks you all in and dry um, and how to deal with it in my own life, coping. For instance, my, my elder sister was a schizophrenic. And one of the things that I found was really awkward and strange in that dynamic. I think there's a real pecking order in a family. And when she got sick, I felt like our order switched. In, and I became the older sister, which is really an awkward thing in a, in a family. So how to cope and also how to write about this issue without infringing on somebody else's privacy. Um, so as an artist, different than a painter maybe, especially as a word artist, you deal with you know very specific things in your narratives, specific people. Um, so I had to find a way to write about some of these topics that were my own pain and not taking on my sister's pain um, and, and to be able to write about it in a way that other people could relate. So I had to find coping mechanisms on all those uh, respects. So my second book here um, is called In the Event of Full Disclosure, which is about the idea of dealing with mental health, dealing with family, how to deal with these particular issues, how to write about them, etc. And Oops. So what I did was I went to the Virginia Center of the Creative Arts several years ago when I was going through a lot of this. Right before I went to the Virginia Center of the Creative Arts, I, for the first time in my family, we went to a family therapist. First and only time we ever did this as a family, even though we had a lot of issues with this. And then all of a sudden I was, I was at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and I was working on this book. So I decided to weave a long poem through the book. It comes in sections, but it's called Family Therapy. So there are different sections of the poem that weave through the book. And this is Family Therapy 4. It's a poem in couplets. Family Therapy 4. 
It is the thing we always fail to mention on all the forms. The despotic voices dancing off the charts and on the trail of our acrid ancestors. Haphazard and lorn, sniffing us out like cadaver dogs. Our chromosomes flirting on the cordless phone, diseases of the heart and kidney are just the body's bric-a-brac, incorporeal or obscene. We are the doctor's worst nightmare. And we never speak of the endocrine glands, unsavory secretions passed down like the heirloom nobody even wants. We are a rogue nation, no country or comfort zone, inhospitable bedrooms where our parents detonated bombs, blamed the groping in-laws. Our family trait is to remember only the good times, like a last blown kiss at the door, but more like a breath blown over a bottle, forever haunting the offspring. Hush, we'll never tell, yet deep down we know the mind's pain is the last inconsolable and extra gene. Rabid dog in the schoolyard, mean and mad and frothing. So like I said, um, this comes from a weave of a poem that goes through this book and the idea of coping with familial things led me to, and mental health, led me to this book, my third book, which is dealing with kind of more the mental health of our culture and coping with this new world, I think, is a new paradigm, especially for me as a writer that I'm old enough to remember writing pre-internet when I got up in the morning and it was just me and the world and my coffee. And now, you know, this world where I know about 500 people and what muffin they've had in the morning. And that's a very different for me. You know, no one told me about that. Like when you were a writer, it's like I was promised this was a solitary thing, an act. And then all of a sudden, the social media world, and I have had a hard time coping with it. Some days it's all wonderful. It has brought our work out to a mass audience that we never could have done um, otherwise. But it also, it's a whole new way of looking at self, addressing people, where it used to be one-on-one, -on -one, now we're addressing hundreds or thousands. Um, so I was interested in all of this, of course, my book came out literally on the day the world closed down, March 11th, when the um, they canceled March Madness. Here, I've been working about on this book about the internet and how maybe we're addicted. I, I would seriously think we're addicted as a society um, to the internet in an, an unhealthy, healthy ways that addiction works. But I felt like um, here we are March 11th and we were ever more dependent on these screens. Um, so it was kind of ironic, but on the other hand, I felt like it was still important to, you know, look at these subjects. I think we just kind of went into this whole culture, this internet world without like even questioning. I'm glad to see, you know, now, you know, the Instagram thing happening and, and people at least questioning how this is, affecting us. I can't imagine being a 
12 or 13 year old girl and coping with the idea that people were literally, you know, grading me on my every move, on my every outfit, on my every thought. That's a really different way to grow up than, than the way I did. So um, this is called When the Internet is the Loneliest Place on the Planet. Also, this poem houses um, a, an image I always wanted to use. I'm from Chicago, and when I was a child um, from the suburbs going into the city, for me, the marker in the car when we were driving was a big sign in the sky. It was a big red lips, neon, um, the Magicus sign, which was basically a rug company. But there's these huge, um, you can look it up and Google it, the Magicus lips big red lips. I knew at that point, for me, it was like the, um, you know, the moment, you know, you knew you would enter something special. So you can hear the magic is sign here. When the internet is the loneliest place on the planet. Blow by blow, we gave up scents and sunsets to hold our heads in a screen and gawk in our sleep. My blind leading your blind to where the last light is driven to be warehoused. I learn to whisper over graves to measure the heft of our breath next to the soul that lay in that soil devoid of breath. When push comes to shove, when enough is more than enough. When your face sees itself snatched by the swarm of names pell-mell. I'm just parched for a whiff of clean laundry, a bed made from the cheapest smoky sense of its last spent residence, clinging to pastures where the lovesick stargazers go. Yesterday, I mourned a friend whom I've never laid eyes on, never heard the bricks in her voice or saw her mouth, a gaudy brothel of accents straight out of the Bronx by way of Chicago, my birth town. I was born to know that train whistles record the distance of our loneliness. I drifted to sleep smelling the pepper spray my parents shot at each other in the front seat. It was my own garden on the highway under the magicist sign where I could cry all night long in the damp arms of strangers. Each car holding that piece of self that looks for others popping out of a hole like a fox or a wolf, forcing you to see your breath, flick the light switch into the dark classroom in the planetarium of stars. So there again, you know, the weirdness, the, the weird kind of warning. Um, I was friends with this a woman here on Facebook for several years and, and she died. And I just couldn't get over the fact that I never met her in person. I was never in the same room with her. I never heard her voice, but she had, as we all do, we leave some kind of fingerprint here of who we are through our choices, through our aesthetics, and we give some sense of ourself. Um, for me, the human voice is a really unique thing. Like 
I consider myself a voice expert. If I haven't heard somebody's voice in 20 years, you call me on the phone, I'll know exactly who you are. And it really haunted me that I never really heard her voice, um, who this person was. So they're again, coping with this kind of new paradigm of the world that we're in, um, which is still strange to me daily. Um, last poem. Again, about mental health. A lot of these poems in this book have the title with God in it. God becomes many different things and subjects in this book, not all good, um, somewhat authoritarian, I guess, in some ways. Um, this poem is called God is a Medicine Cabinet. This is egregious. The mind's parlor is being wooed before breakfast, even before hitting the sticky gymnasium floor. The keys to your ethos held accountable in a drowning pool of munitions, swerving on the slick road like mood hoodlums on the lamb. You're offered a cigarette on the front lines to come back and report on the internal conflict. Yes, every day is triage. You are the wedge between East and West. You are someone else's war chest. The pharmacist's widow sanctioned pills like beads in a rosary. Every day you or a cloud held up by toothpicks. Battle weary and bootlegged to the nth, every suitcase holds crimpled labels implying you have filled out many forms. You've crossed boundary lines while red Sirens howl with the dogs. On two feet, you landed here. A cotton knoll down a lane of pretend. That moment when as a kid, you learned how to swallow and let go. So um, I asked myself, are we all just sitting here writing a bunch of depressing poems about coping? Um, but I, I've gained so much from listening to your words um, and really the craft of them because poetry is not just about experience, it is that, but it's how we bring that experience to the language and um, to the words. I mean, hearing the music in, in both of your poems um, just, you know, the line breaks and, and how we um, marry this narrative to um, tailor it to language and make the language sing, you know. As poets, we don't have a band behind us, so the cadence and the rhythm has to come from the words. Um, so I, I ask and thank you for this topic because I've always written about mental health, but the idea of coping, that was a really interesting word to me and how much, you know, we fake it or how much coping, what does that mean? And and so thank you for asking me that question. It made me think about a whole lot of other topics. Excellent. Thank you, Cynthia, for, for joining us and for, for rounding out this discussion. Uh, or the, these presentations uh, that I think will lead us into some interesting discussion, which we'll go to now. Thank, Thank you so much, much uh, Jill, Jay, and Cynthia for the uh, words and the emotion uh, that you've shared with us. 
And, and I, I, I think, think one, one of the things, things that uh, is most uh, central in the idea of coping is that there is always an individual or uh, an isolatedness inherent in coping. There is something that cuts us off from either other people or from what we think is normal or for what it is that we're desiring that we have to work through. Uh, and I heard that through all three of the presentations that you gave uh, today for us. And, and I just wonder if, uh, if any of you want to you know, just give some general comments about that idea of uh, cup offedness. Uh, yeah, cut, cut offedness. We would coin that word today. Yeah. I can speak to that, may I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the nexus of my despair did happen when I was in another country. And living, when you're at home and you have a car and you know your grocery store, you have your church, you've got your pals, you've got your haunts, uh, even to the point of having your television set, right? There's always this noise going on. And noise can distract you. It's like a Valium, right? It can distract you from the pain momentarily, or, you know, flex roll, I mean, all of them, you know, distract you from that pain. And they're, I, I, don't, I don't know that they're necessary, but they're, they're necessary in the moment. Then you move to another country where you can't speak the language, where your husband's gone all day doing his crap, and you don't have anybody. And it really, can't, we didn't have a television set. So, I had nothing to listen to or hear. I mean, just sitting alone with my books. And for some reason, I thought that the first book I needed to read in Switzerland was The Sorrows of Young Weather. You know, and it's like, oh, yeah, this will help. You know, uh, and it, the good news or the good thing is that once you strip away the extras, you can really see what's there. And when it's nothing, that's a, that's, 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 that's looking like at, like at a mirror with, that doesn't hold your reflection. Now the bad news is when you strip away the extras, you can see that nothing's there. That sucks. So I was cut off in a lot of ways that sound kind of frivolous to me now, but it was a necessary uh, severance, I suppose. Yeah, I think that that certainly resonates in the work that you shared with us, as well as um, I think I heard it in Jay's uh, you know letter to the Pope. You know, this is not the contract that I signed up for, um, and and you know, how do we deal with with those uh, dis disappointed expectations? That sounds so so minimal compared to what you actually feel uh, in a time where where you don't fit. Where things, where where the world sold you a bill of goods, and you're trying to figure out how to get at least part of your money back. Yeah, e either of the other two uh, want to share about that. I think, um, in a similar sense, I think that coping or dealing with these issues has to be by yourself it's just an inherent thing because no human being is going to understand you as well as you do that no one is going to be responsible for your happiness because they're not meant to um so in the same sense through this poetry or through our writing i suppose we are putting down exactly what we want the response we want or the knowledge we want like in our world entire um it's very much wanting to be understood in a way that you can understand or a way that you want to be understood yeah i think that's right jay the uh the, the term self-care you know is used much more frequently, you know, than it wasn't a, a phrase that I ever heard growing up. But today we hear about self care. You got to do what you do for yourself. Um, and there was a line that uh, Cynthia used uh, that stuck with me. She said, Every day is triage. 
Uh, and that, that triage is, yeah, we have to figure out how to stop the bleeding. We have to figure out how to make it not, you know, to the next hour, to, to, to the next point at which I can uh, find a way to make it to the hour after that and an hour after that. So, uh, yeah, there's so much that is inherent in the individual that can't be given away. Uh, you know, for all the good that a therapist does, you know, if there's no cooperation from the individual, you know, nothing really happens. Uh, other thoughts about that? Um, well, I think it was interesting what the conversation we were having when we started here about hurricanes and tornadoes and weather. Um, for me as a child coming from a divorced home where my parents fought literally all the time and I don't have any good memories. The best memory I have of my family togetherness is when I live in, in, lived in Illinois. We had tornadoes all the time. So my dad would gather us all up in the middle of the night and my mom would make Jiffy Pop and we'd go down in the basement and huddle together. And um, out of that fear of coping something in an out external force, it is literally my most safe and wonderful memory of my family is being huddled together in those moments of, of fear. So I guess one of my thoughts right now is that we're constantly struggling between the external and internal forces um, and then mix that with memory and you know how we write about things and how all these forces come together um, you know, the wonderful mystery of writing and thinking you're going to, you start to write about something you think you know, and then by the end of the poem, it's gone in a completely different direction. Um, anyway, so I just throw that out there and, and, and in terms of this yin and yang that I think we are constantly living in and triage is, uh, you know, what's the more important pain I have today, you know, I'm going to deal with this one. Um, so pain is uh, something we live with, but we also make art out of it. Yeah, I think without, we're probably all as writers and artists have had some kind of trauma in our life. Um, you know, writing about the football player and the, the queen and the king and everything's wonderful. And, you know, how boring is that? So and we read to help our help our our own pain and get through our own experience through identifying with the experience of others. So art is magic, I think, and me and medicine. <laughs> well, and I think that you 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 use the the yin and yang example. Uh, when we write poetry, we write it for ourselves, but we don't just write it for ourselves. You know, much of what we write is for others. Uh, not that we're we're pandering to what will sell, but that we are trying to recognize that my experience is not the only one. And I know that you do that, Cynthia, uh, in the event of full disclosure, is is about dealing with other people's problems as much as anything. So... Uh, I wonder if, if any of you want to talk about how how poetry takes on not the role of the one in pain, but maybe the therapist or the sounding board for people who are in pain reading. I think it, I, again, I think it goes back to the idea that you are responsible for your own work or that this idea of independence and being an independent person or a person just trapped within uh, a, a phrase that I used the other day when talking to my partner that you are a soul with a body you are not a body with a soul um, the idea that you're trapped within yourself and that I think is what poetry is it's a way of discussion with oneself a way of coping and healing and I think we see that in elements in the personal touches more than say in fiction like if uh cynthia's poem had been a story and we heard about these these this red lip sign i don't think it would have been as effective if we didn't know that was coming from the poet themselves 
coming from their experience and their heart and that's how they hope or that's how they deal with that i have a little well i don't think it's a different take on it i heard uh, the memoirist emily rap uh, i don't know if you know her she's fantastic speak once to the difference between the things that are therapeutic and things that are cathartic Therapy is a bomb. Catharsis is an explosion. I find writing not therapeutic in the least. It doesn't make me feel better. I, I feel like I'm doing my best when I feel a little bit worse, but I also feel kind of better in that moment. It's this almost wicked free spawn of glee that excites me about being able to distill that, that whatever into that moment and i think that's also why i play with form a lot because i i do like being bound i like having that that small space to deal with something that is otherwise quite large you know so it's a it's a big old explosion control it's like hadron collider or something it's controlled you know it's it, it, it's a it's an explosion control in the palm of your hand and uh, i find that painful, but I also find it exciting. And, you know, writers are weird. We live in paradox. So for me, that's, that's how I describe it, certainly to myself. And I know it does, it's not the same for everybody. But that does, no, I, to the, it's you. It's you in the page. Mm. You know, it's, it's nobody else can fix a thing for you. Nobody else is living that thing for you. It's just, you know, the two of you right there. Mm -hmm. You're the pen. I used to teach a course called Mean Mad Jeans. Um, it was interesting. It was the same year, actually, the shooting had happened at, um, what was the very, at, uh, in Blacksburg. It was one of the very first school shootings. But I was teaching this course over at Roanoke College. No one paid any attention to the course until that shooting happened, and then all of a sudden they became very interested in it. But basically, the course we we're reading Kate Jamison, and you know, what is it about artists that we deal with a lot of mental health issues, whether it's bipolar or you know, however that you know, I don't know if we want to put a you know a label on it. But what what Kate Jamison said was. The difference between serial killers and artists is that we have a place to put it. We have, you know, a tool in our toolbox that allows us to paint or make music or make art. And that kid that walks into a school and blows people away and is feeling all that pain doesn't have that, that capacity, you know, to put it somewhere. Um, and it becomes explosive and dangerous and violent. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about that kid who, who put that drawing on his teacher's desk that day. And because we tell kids, make art, make art about your pain. And, you know, where all those lines are drawn between, you know, what does that teacher do with that? You know, as, as teachers, our students tell us private, terrible things all the time. And where do we draw the line between, you know, what's art, what's really not healthy, and when is this person going to do something, you know, that's really, really explosive? Um, so I think in our in our culture, in our society, we also have, have to ask these questions, you know. What is the line between art and danger and violence? Because we're really here at this point in coping, you know. It's not just, oh, can we get through the day? It's some kid who, you know, has to go in and do a very violent act. Um, so like anything, there's there's degrees of, of all of this. But I'm so happy because in my youth or younger times, we didn't talk about any of this. So we're talking about it right now. And that's, that's therapy and catharsis. Yeah, and I, I, I like the idea that, that Jill suggests is that our explosions on the page are what make the difference uh, in us as writers, uh, more than once, you know, I have been drafting a poem 
and suddenly a whole new ending comes to me and i realize that's where the poem has been going even though my consciousness didn't didn't guide it there and i recognize that 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 can happen you you might think that there needs to be some kind of violent response to your world until you recognize well maybe there's another way maybe i can go another direction with this um so so i like that idea that let you know, let the page be where that explosion occurs One of the things that has happened to me out of the pandemic, because I write a lot, of, I've often my whole life written about a lot of pain. Um, and the hardest thing too for me is writing about joy. But writing through the pandemic has made me appreciate more joyful things and things. So I've been wanting to write about more joy and more joyful things. And I found myself the other day, I gave myself this little challenge. I, I was going with the poem and I was starting to go with the pain and the uh, and the, and I said, I'm just going to turn this around and turn it into all happy, joyful things. And um, the poem just took a really interesting direction. Um, Cause I always think who wants to read, you know, about happy stuff or joyful things. Um, so it's been a new, a new thing for me to, to kind of um, tap into joy and writing about joy and more challenging in a way for me. It's easy to write about pain for me. How do you guys feel about that? Nah, I can't do joy. I'm working on being more inscrutable and mysterious. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I don't truck with joy on the page. But uh, it's because I've never, I, I, I hit that wall. You know, I, I don't know how to make that into art. I feel pretty, a lot That's of a good AWP uh, topic, right? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe that becomes our uh, our challenge for this month is to write a poem with joy in it somewhere uh, and see what uh, see where that joy goes. You know, you somebody with the name Joy. Well, <laughs> recognize that you will have layers layers just with that name. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe that's our challenge. And uh, I don't think joy has to be a sappy saccharine thing. No, I, I know that. I know that. It's just yeah. It's it, it is. You said the word challenge. It is a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other thoughts uh, as we wrap up our conclusion? I'd love to hear from Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts? Um, I'm just the tech person. <laughs> <laughs> you I will are find, far more. I will than find a tech great person. joy in editing this panel. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I do Go ahead, think, Jay. Um, writing about joy, so to speak, like it is. You said joy, and it sounds kind of corny. Um, but I think joy can be expressed in different ways. Like, for instance, in the same way, Cynthia, I, during the pandemic, have kind of moved away from that more angry stuff to um, to just funny or just sentimental. Uh, I've written a lot of story or a little lot of poems about my family over this last while because my. My grandmother, God bless her, she's 91 next week and she has dementia. So um, it's been it's been hard watching her sort of it, through her bad days. Um, but she calls me Daisy, which is her son's name. She thinks I'm her, her wee boy in her own words. So um, about that and how this is a very painful thing that the family is going through. How it's also, well, oh, getting a glimpse into what her life was like far, far before any of us. Like she told me a story that no one else had heard before about her on Victory Day in Europe um, in World War II. She went down to the town square and she danced with her sister. And I didn't hear that story before. And you know, I've been alive, what, 25 years now? <laughs> it's just finding those little sentimental 
nuggets or joyous nuggets to latch on to and hold on to as memories, which I think dementia, as terrible as it is, has the ability to highlight. Jay, there was a line you used, and it struck me. It was in the first poem, something along the lines of, forgive me, Father. It's like, this ain't McDonald's. You can't order what you want. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it struck me, I'm like, oh, humor. Humor is the, the, dark tw the dark twin of joy, you know, because what is the mm -hmm. practical definition? Uh, comedy is tragedy plus time. And uh, it's that, you know, it's like writing a scene in fiction that's really angry, but using a lot of exclamation points. Do you, if, if you can write an angry scene with periods, that's the thing. And I, I feel the same kind of tension resolves itself in, in that kind of use of humor, you know, mm -hmm. in a poem. Well, that's kind of what I wanted for um, Open Letter as mm -hmm. well because it comes at a point in the book where up until then i'm just talking about sex very blatantly i'm talking about um really irreverent poems like there's one called um a love letter for the swine where i talk about if i go to hell tomorrow it's gonna be because i ate meat on on good friday or something like that um but it really is a turning point where that humor throughout that poem, I think, disappears. And it gets replaced with this sort of cold anger. And um, I feel like where you can use humor to mask sadness, um, like, po like, you know, comedians like Robin Williams very much highlights, um, at some point something has to give. Or there are some things that humor can't fix that you just have to face head on. Um, humor you can use as a crutch, like I do throughout most of my poetry, but um, at some point you just have to face, like you said, face uh, the page and face yourself in the mirror of it. Well, just as an aside, it didn't feel crutchy at all. And it had that moment of resolution. I mean, what you said, you actually did quite well. I, I took notes, actually. <laughs> you figure out how to do this. Uh, you just slide right into that. It, it catches a reader unawares. It's not a crutch. It's a, it's a, it's a craft. It's craft. You want to be careful. Like I need to get out of this room at some point. I don't need that big of a head. <laughs> <laughs> well, is humor joy? I don't know. What? What? Where do we place humor? on the um the line of i mean for me when you if in a poem if you can create as you did in that poem both sadness and humor together you know then you really got me and it, it's a hard thing to do um but when it's done done well it's really powerful thank you all for uh your comments today it makes me think that we may need a future panel on the poetry of joy or maybe the poetry of humor uh we'll we'll have to think about those things uh but in any case for today i'm thankful that you have brought humor and joy into the poetry of coping um and so we'll uh, sign up for today thank you jill jay and cynthia this is Pig Glass Poetry Panels, Stan Galloway saying, have a wonderful, joyous day.